incredible, uh, incredible uh, topic and lecture. We have the honor, uh, if if nobody knows this gentleman here today, D Mr. David Sipperly. Um, he's probably, I would say, hands down, one of the most knowledgeable gentlemen in the removable, analog, and digital uh, denture space that I've come come across. And not only is he knowledgeable, he's a completely agnostic and in, in really caring about what we deliver to the patient. So um, I want to take a minute to say, David, thank you for spending time with us today. And we look forward to it. And more than anything, um, uh, you know, on top of his knowledge and his, his acumen is He's a terrific gentleman and a great friend for many, many years. So, uh, David, thank you. Uh, the floor is yours, and I can't wait to hear uh, what you got for us today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John, and uh, thank you, Jessica. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure working with the two of you folks. And, of course, DSG has been a great customer and a great partner with Densply Serona for, for many, many years. Uh, so, Jessica, I'm assuming uh, I've got complete control now. You have complete control. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining. I'm going to jump right into it here. Today, I'd like to talk about some denture facts that are important to know. Uh, we're going to obviously quickly review the overall traditional denture process. We'll talk about the different types of denture workflows uh, that are digital to that's available to you, uh, and they're milling and printing, of course. And, and really, we need to uh, discuss reference dentures because that's where most people are having success with with digital dentures. And then we're gonna end it on some lighter notes uh, about consumerism and trying to increase your case acceptance, all very uh, important topics. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right into it and say, let the uh, evolution begin here. We know that doctors don't like doing removables. Um, and there's lots of reasons, too many appointments, anywhere from five to 10 and even more. So they're viewed as you're married to the patient, you can't satisfy them, you can't make any money doing them. Well. Some of that's true, but there's a lot of people making a lot of good money by offering removables. It's definitely an uncomfortable process. We know lots of people report poor fit, pain, uh, and issues with their dentures. I mean, denture adhesive creams are a multi-billion dollar industry in the United States. Why is that? Uh, there's a lot of problems out there. And we know that most people are just generally unhappy with their current denture. Now, from a, from a clinician point of view, uh, we know that we can give you greater efficiency and put more money in your pocket. We can give you higher patient uh, satisfaction, which will help with patient referrals. And overall, it's just a far better experience. And uh, Jessica, I'm having trouble here. Uh, never mind, I just muted or sorry, minimized my uh, video chat. And of course, we can give you higher profitability here. So um, there's tons of reports out there that say that more people or most patients would pay more for a better denture. Um, and there's tons of them out there. So if we look at the denture process, this is the five step process we teach in dental school. Uh, it's five, five visits for the patient going to your office and the lab has four major steps in creating uh, a, a removable appliance and in this case, a full denture. Um, so we know the preliminary impression with a stock tray then there's the final impression with a custom tray. Then there's the uh, occlusal registration appointment where we use the bite rims, which have a lot of inherent problems with bite rims for lots of reasons. And then finally, in the fourth visit, the patient finally starts to see what their new smile might look like with a waxed indenture, okay? But is it really just one visit? Because often we hear of resets and, and two are quite common. And of course, sometimes even three. So what you're trying to do, of course, is make the patient happy uh, before the denture's processed. Because once it's processed, it's done. And then you deliver it. But are you really done? Because I'm shocked what I hear about how many times a patient will come back with, with complaints or, or adjustments that are needed. So how many adjustments do you see? Is it one to three? Because this is taking up chair side time. You're not making any production with this. Is it three to five? or is it five plus? And I've heard some crazy numbers. So this is totally the, the total profit killer right here. So I think we can improve this all with digital dentures. So we know there's lots of issues with conventional dentures. They're, they're uneven, they're thick, they're thin, teeth move. 
uh, tooth pop-offs can occur. The try-ins don't fit like the final denture. The final denture doesn't fit like the try-in. So it's really a challenge of, of doing a conventional denture. It really is. It's not only for you, but also for the lab. We've been making dentures the same way over a hundred years. So truly for you, I think that we can uh, help you big time with digital dentures. And that is really about the permanent digital record because we know that people break them, lose them, and pets have an affinity for oral appliances. So within a year, they got a new denture and now they've got to replace it because it's missing or broken. That's crazy. We can just print or now mill a new one and make that one appointment. Think of the value that that would add to your patients. Okay, we know it's gonna save chair side time and I'll show you that in a few minutes. But for the patient, better fit. That's the number one thing they say is, oh my God, the fit. And usually when that denture goes in their mouth, their eyes pop because they didn't experience fit like that before. Overall improved patient experience. And of course we can give you great uh, aesthetics and durability with, with a Densplicer on a product. Uh, and it addresses the aging population. Dentures are not going away. In fact, we, it's growing fairly robustly at two or 3%. Uh, which is the annual growth of, of the industry, more or less. So the good news is this, and the bad news. You know, digital technology and adoption in dentistry is real. It's a hot topic, both chairside and for the lab. And ultimately, you need to decide, do I want to spend and invest in digital technology? And do I want to learn it? Because this is all uh, based on, on change, and technology is changing the every, everything that we're doing. The good news is for a digital denture, you don't have to invest in anything. The lab already has. DSG has more technology than most labs out there. So they've adopted in the technology to make your life better, okay? So we're gonna go through the denture process. Notice now there's four steps here rather than five. So we're saving you one 30 minute appointment. And it all starts with a preliminary impression. So that doesn't have any change to what you normally do every day in your life as a, as a clinician, okay? So we're gonna use a, a a uh, stock tray and we're gonna take a preliminary impression. No problem, okay? Alginate's fine. We don't have any strong recommendations over impression materials. They all work, they all work fine. We know that alginates are pretty popular for this point in time. And then th that's gonna be sent to the laboratory, okay? And the lab's gonna pour up a model, they're gonna make a custom tray and they're gonna make a set of bite rims. So that's really simple, okay? They're gonna use type three dental stone. And if you're ever pouring up your own models in your own dental office, you should be using type three dental stone and not stone and plaster. We're talking about master models here. You need a good custom tray material, whether the lab makes a custom tray or you're using various other trays that are on the mar market, they're all fine, they're all suitable. And then you need a good bite rim, but the bite rim has to be on a stabilized process base. And there's lots of ways of making bases. There are shellac bases, there are suck downs, there are light cured bases, there are even tray resins that people use to make bases. But it's gotta be strong and stable. Otherwise you're gonna have fit issues and or you could have fit issues just because of the way that the process um, is being used by, by either you or the laboratory. So now, when you as a clinician receive those custom trays and bite rims, we're asking you to take a final impression and we're asking you to do the uh, registration all in one appointment. So it's, it's a little bit different than you're used to doing, but it does not take that much time. It takes about, about 30 to 40 minutes and then most people can get that down to about 25 minutes of time. So it fits well within a 30 minute appointment. So nothing really new there other than combining these two steps. Now we are gonna ask you to border mold. If you're not border molding, you should. That really does help capture the vestibule of where that denture is going to fit. And it allows good and easy scanning uh, when, when we have that, that landing, okay? So we do encourage border molding for this. And of course you can see what it looks like here in the mouth. And what we're asking is a good impression because the lab is gonna digitize the impression. So the denture is only going to fit as good as your impression is, okay? So we've got to make sure that it has a nice uniform thickness of a material, there's no thin spots. And if we can't capture these landmarks, we're not gonna make a good fitting denture, whether it's done analog or with digital denture techniques. We need to capture these landmarks, okay? So we often hear that the impressions 
don't always capture stuff. And we know it's difficult to take a full arch impression. A lot of people gag and they don't like it. It's an uncomfortable experience. And even fast set takes two or three minutes for to set. But we have to avoid bad impressions, okay? We really do because we're gonna digitize that impression and it's gonna be exactly a one-to-one -one of that, of that uh, impression, a one-to-one -one ratio. Now we're also gonna ask you to use your bite rims and uh, use a good registration material so the lab knows how to occlude your two arches together. Uh, what can help with making a, a bite rim work is a fox plane to make sure that you're parallel. And we're asking you that you do a wash impression of that bite rim. Okay, besides marking the midline, besides marking the distal of the canines, and uh, we also need to know if the patient is either right or left side dominant. It would be great to get a smile line, either a lip line, high line, or a smile line. Uh, and if you can't give us that, then just give us a reading off of a papillometer, and that would help. So we need a, a, a good custom tray with border molding, and we need a good wash impression with those landmarks. So whether you're really doing a digital denture or a uh, analog denture, we still need those uh, pieces of information on there and they're on your script pad. Uh, but the more information you can provide us, the better. And even if you can include digital pictures of the patient, the better. The more information, the better we can uh, just decide what is best for the patient. So now all of those records go back to the lab and the lab has a choice. We can do an analog denture. We can start stripping off your bite rims and start setting up teeth in an analog way. It takes a lot of skill and time. Or we can do it digitally and we're gonna focus down below on the digital. So uh, it's, it's really amazing what the technology has done in the last three years. And Crown and Bridge paved the way. We've been doing zirconia crowns, which is a fully digital process for over 16 years now. So now digital with dentures, it's not gonna take 15 years. It's gonna take two or three years before it takes off. So now the lab will gonna, is using an extra oral scanner, would digitize the files because we need to produce a try-in. So really this is all for the lab right here. And there are lots of scanners that they have and can use. And they're gonna start stitching together all of the different layers. So they gotta scan the custom tray, they gotta scan the uh, bite rims, and it starts stitching together all of this information. Okay, so regardless of the scanner that they use, basically the digital workflows are all the same. You do your administration in the CAD system, you scan your, uh, your models and your uh, data points, and then you do a model analysis. So using sound prosthodontic principles that you see in that middle picture there, they're going to identify the landmarks and then the computer is gonna start setting up teeth or create an artificial bite plane to represent what you have there. And then they're gonna export it to either a printing uh, unit or a milling unit. Now there's lots of software out there. You can use 3Shape, you can use InLab, you can use ExoCAD. So lots of good in-house design softwares and or you can even outsource it to Avident or Full Contour for a design, okay? So they've got to create a design. And then with that design, again, it's up to the lab of what do they want to do, okay? So this is a complicated picture, but just follow me on the journey. So you scan your data, you design your denture. In this case, you have a, two choices here. You can do a biogeneric general tooth library and scan an arch. Or in this case, we're going to use uh, dense Plicerona IPN 3D teeth. So we have our tooth library in the design software. So then of course we design our denture and we send it to our milling unit here. And with that milling unit, it's gotta be a five access mill. We can mill a try-in out of PMMA, tooth colored. And if everything goes well with the try-in, we can mill our denture base out of a denture base disc. And now I'm looking at the workflow up top. With that, we could bond in our IPN teeth using HIPAA and make a finished denture using pre-manufactured teeth. Or you could follow the workflow down below where you still mill a try-in out of a PMMA puck that's tooth colored. Then you mill your denture base with sockets. Then you can mill out your denture teeth either in arches or in quadrants or in singles and then bond them for a finished denture. So there's, there's mul multiple ways of doing milling. Some involve pre-manufactured teeth others used milled or printed teeth. And there's a pros and cons to both, okay? If we look at a printing point of view, it's the same design, print, wash, bond, cure, and finish that everyone, regardless of company, has to follow. 
Those are the basic workflow steps. So again, you can design using pre-manufactured teeth. In this example, it's a dense Plicerona mod model, but other manufacturers make printed teeth uh, or resins for printing teeth and printing base plates as well. So again, pre-manufactured teeth, we send that output to a carbon printer and DSG does have carbon printers. They're absolutely phenomenal. It's state of the art. It's the Ferrari and Mercedes of printers and excellent longevity. And uh, so you print out your try-in. It also allows you to print out your denture base using again, IPN pre-manufactured teeth. You can then use uh, a bonding agent to bond those teeth and finish curing it. And you have a finished denture or you can go to a third party print and then print teeth and uh, denture base and bond into one. So now we're going back to the try-in, okay? So we have our printed try-in, or in this case, this is a traditional try-in. This is a waxed up try-in. So this reduces the chance of a remake, which is costly because the lab already processes final denture and acrylic. We're looking for patient acceptance, right? And often this is two or three resets, okay? And, and, and it, the patient thinks, hey, doc, you know, this is what I want. And so a try-in is a way of making sure that the doctor was listening to the needs and the wants of the patient. But this could be an endless loop because try-ins might not ever be right. They're never gonna be perfect. And we know that there's a fit difference between this and the final denture, or there can be a fit difference. And we tell the patient not to bite too hard because it's wax. And so it has limitations, okay? Again, uh, at the try-in, we're looking for midline harmony. We're looking for aesthetics. We're looking for that buckle corridor. Is everything in proportion? And of course, is there aesthetics? Is there function and is there phonetics? Can they talk without slurring and spitting and so forth? So that's your traditional waxin, but a biofunctional try-in or digital try-in can be two types. Biofunctional, which is pure PMMA on the left. And there's even a modification of that called a Wagner try-in, which has a combination of of milled and some wax allows you to move teeth a little bit. Uh, now that Wagner trine I think is available through, through Avident. I think some labs have the ability to make that, but what's common is either printing or milling that biofunctional trine. Okay, it can be ground on, so you can modify it. You can do a wash impression with it. Uh, and of course you can add composite to it or make any changes to it with, with a hand piece. Okay, but it's, and it's available in tooth shades and it really gives you the impression and the bite all into one, okay? So I was always a little skeptical of trial biofunctional try-ins because doctors always want that adjustment of teeth, but the adjustment of teeth causes so many problems. So a few years ago at the Digital Denture Symposium in, in, uh, in Arizona, Dr. Valerie Cooper gave a presentation and she absolutely reduced the number of her try-ins from two down to less than 0.4 visits in about a three year period. And in 2016, so she, she averaged often almost two appointments for the try-in. So she knocked that down to 1.4. And in 2016, she did 178 dentures and she saved about 170 hours of chair side time using a biofunctional try-in. And I, I couldn't believe that. that. That equates, if you look at $7 a minute, you know, a, a production goal of a, of a clinician, $7 a minute. It's actually close, closer to eight, but at $7 a minute, she saved over $71,000 of chair side time. That's rather significant. That caught my eye. So it does require a new mindset. And here's a biofunctional try-in. And there's a couple of ways that this can be used, okay? But you've got to think of just four things that are patient-centric, okay? Because often we'll ask them, hey, how does it fit? How does it feel? Okay, well, here's what you got to ask them. Fit, does it feel good? Real simple question. Size, how do you like it? You want it bigger or smaller? Okay. Position, you want it up, down, right, or left? And then darker, color, do you want it lighter or darker? Ask those four things. Keep it so simple and the patients will tell you what they want. Now, the biggest thing that I love about a biofunctional trine is it's stable. Teeth move in wax. They shift and ship shipping, okay? If it's a hot day out there, teeth can move. You know, there's a lot of different qualities of setup wax out there. So this eliminates all those problems. Plus it's easier for you. The patient bites too hard. You don't have to worry about anything shifting in the mouth. They could even take this home as a try-in and test drive it for a day or two or three if you wanted to offer that. 
be, and then you can make adjustments. Okay, so I think the biofunctional try-in is is key now, and I was always skeptical of it at first, but now this is the secret sauce. Bear with me one second; my computer just froze up here. Okay, so now um, we talk about pre-manufactured teeth in the past, and these new teeth are designed to try to minimize intaglio breakthrough, and that's the problem um, with with printed dentures. If you don't have enough vertical space, the teeth are too big; they don't fit and you'll have intaglio breakthrough in the denture design. With milling, that's not a big concern because a second set milling will just grind those teeth away and it won't be a problem. Um, but we've made pre-manufactured teeth now specific for printing. So they're still uh, bioform and portrait inspired. Uh, we give you some, uh, you know, 16 Vita shades and some bleach. Uh, we give you really good wear resistance, really good aesthetics, and it's in a pack, new uh, wax-free packaging. So we're, we're trying to save time. And, and we give you 51 pre-occluded libraries for the software. So it makes the dis digital denture design very simple and easy. And then we give you 10 and 33 degree choices. So with these pre-manufactured teeth, uh, that's one way of you can print them. Uh, you can use pre-manufactured teeth, but a lab can also have a choice of printing them or, or milling them. In this case, here are some of the mills. You need a five access mill. And here's a disc of PMMA material and you can mill it the arch that you see there. Okay, so lots of choices. And so what you need to do is, and I, I think clinicians need to be aware of the processes so you know what the labs need to do and what, what the labs expect from you. So here we digitize our, our uh, denture, and then you can see this is what milling a denture base looks like. So they're gonna put the puck into a five axis milling machine. You're gonna mill out those tooth sockets. So then you're gonna bond those teeth into place using Lucitone HIPAA. And you're going to leave the denture um, base in the puck. Okay, bond all the teeth, so that means they're going to take them in pressure pot them. And then when the bonding of teeth is done, they're going to put the disc with the teeth in there back into the denture mill a second time. Okay, and that's important. So there's a little special keyway that we've made for our Lucitone disc. So you put the disc back in, and now the intaglio surface is going to be milled. So if you happen to have intaglio breakthrough because of the vertical dimension or the space with the denture teeth, no worries. The mill is going to mill the entire backside of that disc and get it to where you need it. So then the second pass mill looks like this. Then the lab tech will, of course, cut off the sprues and then grind down those spots and do a traditional polish. So it's pretty straightforward. And of course, you can also print your denture base and print your teeth. So there's there's no printing a true monolithic denture from start to finish yet because there's no way of figuring out how to layer the shades of material. So they're gonna print the denture base first, they're gonna print the teeth next, and then they're gonna bond the two together, okay? So I wanna talk to you quickly about the carbon and Lucitone digital print uh, system here. Uh, this is fascinating technology. Carbon, like I said earlier, is the leader in printing technology. And we've created a new generation of resin that is uh, high impact uh, and is uh, very aesthetic, comes in five shades. So you're gonna print your arches of material and then you're gonna break off the fencing uh, from the printer. And then of course we have to do a part washing or cleaning. We've gotta get rid of all the printing residue and we do so by using isopropyl alcohol and an ultrasonic cleaner. And there's a few steps here that they've gotta do to get that printing residue off. Notice those bar supports that are there. Those stay in place until the final denture is completely cured because it's still in its green state. It's still relatively soft. And then we're gonna take our pre-manufactured IPN 3D teeth and soak them in a bonding agent. We call it Fuse, Fuse 1. So we soak the teeth for a chemical bond because the teeth are PMMA acrylic and the printed denture base is, is an acrylic with other resins and composites added to it. Okay, it's a, similar to a light cure type composite. Then we're gonna take Fuse Step 2 or fuse to, which is a resin. We're gonna put the resin in the tooth socket. We're gonna place the pre-manufactured teeth and then they snap right in almost like Legos. And we're gonna tack light them with a UV light at the bench. And we're gonna build the entire arch. And then once the entire arch is done, we're gonna paint fuse three, which is a sealer around the cervical of the teeth and the interproximals. And then we're gonna go ahead and cure it. And we cure it in a special light curing unit called the InLab Speed Cure. And that's gonna bring the full properties of this material to life here. So uh, we do a, a flip cure. And in 26 minutes later, the denture is at its final strength. 
So then we're going to cut off the sprues or the supports and we do a traditional polish and shine. And this is called Lucitone Digital Print. Lucitone is always known for uh, a beautiful uh, shade and, and nice luster and, and easy to shine. So that's a 3D printed denture with uh, IPN 3D teeth and Lucitone Digital Print. And it's high impact. So now we send that off to you um, once we QC it. And then you can place it in the patient's mouth. And of course, if you need to make any adjustments on it, you can. Um, so that's pretty much the denture process, four steps. Okay. So now let's talk about reference dentures because four steps is still a lot for some clinicians to do their first digital denture from A to Z, unless you're used to doing them already. But reference dentures are a great way to get familiar with digital dentures. And there's a, there's a two or three appointment option. We just went through a four, four appointment option. Okay. So you've got to decide how it's best to send these records to your laboratory. Okay. So what you're going to take is an existing denture. And of course, if it's in good shape and they just want a new one, uh, you're going to do a wash impression and you're going to give us a nice bite, bite registration. And you can send that to the laboratory yourself or they can pick it up with their courier service. Okay. It's up to you. You might even have the patient drive it to the laboratory. Okay. That way they can then scan it and give the denture right back to the patient so they can go home with it. It's up to you. Or you could duplicate that denture in house, like with a Lang duplicating system. Okay. That's one other way. That way the patient doesn't have to be without their denture. Or you could take your intraoral scanner. In this case, this is a prime scan and work with your lab to learn how to do this scanning and send that digital impression to the lab. We have people doing it and it's working. Okay. And the other nice thing about a reference denture is there's about four to 5 million of them out there. Okay. So they say that we roughly have about 35 million edentulous or partially edentulous Americans, the U S okay. 90% of them have something. So it's about 31 million denture wearers out there. Uh, it's estimated that 15% of them get a new prosthesis every year. So that's somewhere around 4.7 or 5 million dentures being manufactured every year by US laboratories, never mind the new work as our aging baby boomers come. So there's a lot of reference dentures that you can use to uh, create uh, your first digital denture if you haven't done one already. And those stats came from gotoapro.com, which is the uh, American College of Prosthodontists. So these options are up to you. And here's the three-step appointment, okay? We're asking you to take a wash impression and bite with that existing denture patient, send it to the lab. However you send it, it's up to you. Lab is going to scan and design your try-in. Okay. So then you're going to go back patient number three. They're going to check out that try-in or that biofunctional try-in, do a wash impression on that or make any adjustments if needed. The lab would then rescan and redesign the final denture based on your records other, or it can stay the same. And then of course, the third appointment with the patient, they get their new digital denture. Okay, that's your three step process. But what we find a lot of people are doing is a two step process. You're just taking that wash impression and bite. The lab is scanning and designing a denture and going right to final print or final mill, saving a lot of time. And we're finding that it's working out very, very well. So the patient only sees, needs to see you twice. And God forbid if the patient's dog, um, chews on the denture because we know pets have an affinity for these things or they break or lose it in a short amount of time they can just call you you can call the lab and the lab can make you another one that's only one appointment that's an incredible service having that digital record so i think digital dentures can change lives here's a great patient uh, from a to z you can see the uh, initial impressions face bow bite bite rims you can see the biofunctional trine in the upper right hand corner the finished denture and you can see we've really helped this patient with, with, uh, with her aesthetics, with her facial support, and we brought back a healthy smile. So I think these kinds of pictures are selling aids that you should use in your office. If you get permission of your patients to use some pictures, pictures are worth a thousand words. They really are, and that's why I like pictures so much. So now we're going to change gears a little bit. We're doing well on time, and uh, I want to talk about consumerism in the healthcare market, and I want to talk about uh, case acceptance. Now, the consumers can be broken down into six 
healthcare consumers. All right, so first let's look at what we have down at the very bottom. And this came from the ADA in 2013. We have millennials, we have Gen Xs, we have baby boomers, and we have seniors, okay? So those groups can be broken down into six other groups. The casual and cautious, which is a patient, okay, that is not engaged, doesn't have a, a current need, and they're very cost conscious of spending money on their health because they're worried about their cars, they're worried about houses and you know, raising a family or school, whatever the case may be. Then there's another patient segment that's content and compliant and they will follow a treatment plan. And I'm working in the upper left-hand corner here. Then when we have the online and on board, they're happy with care, they like technology, they like alternatives, and they're probably your perfect candidate for a digital denture. We have the sick and the savvy, they're heavy consumers, they work with doctors to make decisions, they have problems, you know, whether it's overall systemic health or oral health issues. So they, they have no choice but to go see a physician or, or a dentist. Then there's the out and about who really are tough customers to please. They're not afraid about spending money. They're just pretty hard to please because they're very picky. They want customized services, you know. And then there's the uh, shop and save. They're, they're very cost um, uh, concerned and might switch for value or price, okay? And not necessarily uh, the best of the best. They'd, they'd rather save their money for other, other health costs. So if those are the six segments and they're, they're color coordinated up top to fit down on the bottom. So I wanna look at the extremes, okay? The millennials, 46% are casual and cautious. So they, dark blue represents the dark blue up top they don't really like going to the dentist and they're not gonna spend a lot of money, okay, with you because they have no needs. But 16% of them will try, follow your treatment plan. Whatever you tell them, they're gonna trust you, believe you, and they wanna do it. 18% will wanna do it as well. 5%, of course, they're, uh, they're relatively young and healthy. You know, their mouth is in pretty good sh shape unless there's some sort of trauma or disease or genetics going on there, but they still exist in the millennials. Then 8% want that customized service and 7% are gonna save, okay? So that's, that's kind of crazy. Well, where, where am I going with all of this? Well, let's look at the seniors then. 15% of them are cost conscious and don't really have a need or don't wanna spend money on their healthcare. 40% do, okay, and you can see the numbers go up. So this is what I mean here. 84% of seniors will accept a treatment plan, okay? In boomers, 67% will accept your treatment plan because they wanna work with you, they wanna do what's best for their body. 57% of Gen Xs will, and 47% of millennials will. As people are younger and younger, they wanna spend less and less money on health because they, they think they're young, they're invincible. I don't need to do this now. Well, they don't realize they might live till they're 80, 85, or 90 years old and that their teeth are gonna break down eventually, right? They just will. But in general, 63% of all consumers will accept a plan if it ties into their lifestyle, into their needs, okay? And 37% probably won't. So when you ask for a treatment plan or you ask for an upgrade, why not? 63% will probably go along with it. Okay, so that's, I think, uh, an important data point to know about consumerism. Consumerism's everywhere. Now, we talk about upgrading or cross-selling, okay? So that's really important. But in order to do so, you've got to understand what the customer wants, right? What are your patient needs? So are you listening to your patients empathetically, right? Are we listening with the intent to understand what's going on and what they're trying to explain? and what their needs are and what their expectations are. Because you always hear with denture patients, you can never satisfy them, you can't make them happy. Well, what were their expectations in the first place? Did you know what their expectations were? Because you got a choice here. Do they want a tissue supported denture because they're cost conscious? Or do they want an implant supported denture because they want to be able to eat steak again? Or do you want a digital denture that's gonna be in the middle and give them superior fit and performance, but not cost as much as an implant supported denture? What are your choices? But when you listen with empathy, it shows that you care enough to help them. And most doctors and dentists do this very well. That's your bedside manner. But sometimes we forget or we're in a rush or we think that we don't have time or it's not important. Every patient is important and we gotta make them feel at ease when they're talking to us. So back to consumerism. Consumers don't make logical decisions. They really don't. 
Sometimes they're impulse buyers. Um, and they don't always care about all the details of your treatment plan, but they care about the outcome. Because if I come to the dentist, I want to look great. I don't want to be in pain. I want to be pain free. I want to get rid of the pain or I want to improve my appearance. Okay. And I say consumers don't make cons uh, logical decisions because sometimes they don't. But once they make a decision to buy something, they're usually more likely to buy and pay for something else too. All right. Or the next thing too. Think of Google or, or I'm sorry, Amazon. Last time you bought something on Amazon, you bought it. And so all of a sudden you had a pop up and something else said, hey, people who bought this also bought this too. So they're looking, your, your wallet's open. You already made a conscious effort to go to Amazon to buy something and they know your wallet's open and they're trying to get more of your wallet. So the pop-ups come up for accessory items, support items or similar, similar items, right? Did you go to the grocery store today to buy a magazine and a pack of gum? No, you went to the grocery store to buy dinner for tonight. But while you were waiting in line, oh, the magazine caught your eye or that pack of gum caught your eye. I could use that, you bought it. There, those incidentals are put there on purpose to make you grab them because they're an impulse item. Your wallet is open and they're trying to get more money out of you. So if they come and see you for a dental problem they're having, they want it fixed, their wallet is open. So to buy something is difficult, but once they decide to buy, they usually want the best that they can afford. And we don't know what that is. So have a tiered approach with your dentures. Every other product in the world has tiered approaches. You go to Best Buy for a television, good, better, and best. You go to Sherwood Williams to buy paint for your living room, there's good, better, and best paints. You go and buy a Mercedes, there's a good, better, and best Mercedes, okay? So think about all of these. Do you have pricing options or tier pricing options? You should. Now, lots of clinicians present treatment plans in a clinical and logical way, and you should. That's the world we live in. But you also have to get the patient emotionally involved and sell the outcome, okay? Not only present what you're going to do, but what the results are going to be. You're gonna look great again. We're gonna make sure you're pain free. We're gonna give you that functionality again that you wanted, okay? So that's very important. So just because you presented a treatment plan to a patient doesn't necessarily mean they've learned or retained what you told them, you know? Because people all learn differently and they retain information differently, okay? So remember that, because 10% of people learn and retain from what they read 20% from what they hear. People retain and learn 30% from what they see. But wow, 50% from what they see and what they hear. So my point to you in this case is, what visual aids are you going to use to convey your messaging when you're telling patients their options of dental care? Are you gonna have before and after pictures? Are you gonna use some sort of digital imaging to transpose them from their current state into a new proposed state? Do you have that type of software in, the, in your office? Um, or are you gonna just use some good old physical props? You know, you're gonna have some dentures and you're gonna have good, better and best dentures in front of you, okay? Why not give them options? Because they usually want to get the best that they can afford, not just one option. So I really want you to consider what visual aids you'll have. And are they gonna be ready in your room? Or are they in the drawer? or in the waiting room. So this is really important. It also goes back to how you view your business, okay? This is the world of perception we live in. You have a perception of how you are and what your company represents, and you also have a perception of how it's viewed by others. Meanwhile, they view you differently as well, and this is the world of perception we live in. So do you view yourself as a professional service provider, or do you view yourself as a retail service? Or, I think this is more appropriate, a professional service provider who operates in a retail setting. You're one of those three, or you view yourself as one of those three, and if you don't, then you should, okay? Because patients have choices, and I'm going back to consumerism and choices, right? Patients have a range of options from basic care to ideal dental care, whether they realize it or not. Patients can go to other offices for the same or similar services, right? Your business model offers a variety of treatments. Many are of them are elective. 
And to a certain degree, you can c control your own fees, but not always. But you can certainly control what services you provide and what level of care you want to provide. So to me, that sounds like a retail setting, okay? And in a retail setting, you've got to figure out how you're going to sell to your customers and how you're going to market your products and services to your customers and to your customers within your community that you don't currently have as a patient. So that's very important, okay? And then who are your competitors? I don't truly think your competitors are other dentists. You might view that are. Your competitor are the other things they want to spend their money on, right? Because we know a lot of people don't like going to the dentist. They only go once a year for their cleaning because they don't even make their second profi appointment. They miss that or cancel that, okay? Uh, but your, your competitors are other things that are fighting for their cash in their pocket. That's that wallet share that you want, okay? Because when you're younger, you don't need the dental care as much as you get older and your teeth start to break down and wear down. All right. So I think once you realize that you're in a professional um, retail setting, I think you can increase your case acceptance. Okay. You can really maximize your case acceptance if everyone in your office is selling dentistry. Okay. Because you're trying to facilitate a treatment plan for acceptance. Okay. And that's really important. But I hate the word selling. I really do. I'm, I've been a, in professional sales my whole life, three separate industries, industrial tools, sporting goods, and now dental. I've been in dental for 17 years. They all have the same concerns and same selling scenarios. Okay. And it's a hyper competitive environment out there. And you're in a hyper competitive environment as well. So in your case, selling is educating your patients on what they should be doing to maintain their oral health or what they can do to improve it. So education is a, is a nicer word than selling, but if you look up the, in, in dictionary, their definitions, they're very, very parallel. So remember too, in general, patients are uninformed about dental care and what the value of dental is, right? They really are, because they haven't, for the most part, experienced any major problems yet, okay? So most patients kind of come to the dentist for as little as possible, not for what they may need. Okay, but they don't know what they need because they're uninformed. So we've got to help them with their options and inform them of their choices and then let them make the decision. Most dental practices, if you're a single location, single provider, they stagnate at around somewhere around $700,000. They stagnate. And you, you might not be able to get more patients in the door, right? But maybe you can. But you've got to look at what can I do to improve my case acceptance? Or what can I do to get more patients in the door? So it's really, I think, spending that extra time with them doing the consult, whether it's yourself or a staff member doing the consulting. But I have one friend whose case acceptance went up 20%. And I said, well, what did you do for that? He goes, real simple. I let my wife do the uh, treatment planning and consult with them and not me. She was my best salesperson because she took the time to explain everything in a real simple way. And he goes, I usually had a, 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 you know, I felt like I didn't have time. I rushed my, my treatment option discussions with my patients. And I felt like I gave them more of a clinical knowledge overview uh, and, and not so much the heart to heart talk that they wanted sometimes. All right, so we got to move them away from the cheapest plan to their ideal plan, okay? Which is making them live a longer, healthier, happier life. All right, so. I think you have to tie that plan into why they came there in the first place. What is their emotional outcome? What were their expectations? And it's often difficult to get the expectations of denture wearers, okay? They themselves don't know sometimes. But when you have teeth and you're relatively healthy, we take really simple things for granted, like eating, smiling, talking, laughing, and kissing. But when you're edentulous, you don't do those things, or you don't do them that much. You don't do them that often. So we can really improve people's lives, getting back to basic confidence and, and quality of life by offering them dentures, okay? It's a very viable treatment for a lot of people. So we're gonna, a couple more slides and wrap it up, we'll open up the Q&A. So is a digital denture worth the extra money? Because it's gonna be a little bit more than your, your regular denture. And of course it is, absolutely. And here's why. It's a new product that you can offer to your existing patients or new patients maybe. So that's, that's a service expansion, right? It's absolute superior fit. The patient, uh, the first thing they always comment is, wow, it fits so good. So better fit, better function, better confidence. 
you've got that digital record on file, so easier lost damaged denture can be replaced. That leads to better patient experience. And that also leads to increased patient referrals because we know 50% of your business is word of mouth. All right, we know we can eliminate that one step of the denture process from five to four. So at $7 a minute, 30 minute appointment, that's $210 that we just saved you of chair side time. Fewer post insertion visits. That, that's those extra one to five up to 10 after you delivered the final denture. We can reduce those visits by at least one, if not up to five appointments. Okay. So if we save you one po post adjustment visit, that was $210. If we save you five, that's $1,000 of chair side time we saved you, which would be a loss of production. What we normally hear with digital dentures out there is the patient comes back once or they don't come back at all because the fit is that good. I mean, that is significant. Okay, and this right here is going to lead to procedural efficiency. Again, more money into your pocket. Okay, the three E's I like to call them. And I think when you have practice expansion, better patient experience and procedural efficiency, that means you have a healthy practice. Okay, and that's what it's all about today. So uh, I think digital dentures can certainly help this and help prevent this. And, and I, I don't know where this picture was taken, uh, but it's, it, it's, it's kind of funny, but it's kind of sad for the 10th visit. And you can see this clinician or this student, looks like a dental student, is just checked out. Like, I don't know what you want, you go ahead and fix it. So technology is forcing us to change. We're, we're gonna have to change no matter what, uh, but the, the future is very, very bright. We gotta get out of the stone age on the left and move to digital on the right. And, uh, and DSG can help you do that. So I wanna thank you. I'm gonna exit out of the uh, presentation mode so I can go back and see some of the screens and comments. Um, so Jessica, actually I can't see the screen or comments right now. I haven't had any um, questions or um, curiosities or comments. So um, would anybody like to submit anything that we can address with David while we have him? John's hey, hey, David. Yes. Uh, great, great presentation as always. It's this is John Rule. Um, I have uh, I'm getting a few text messages from people, uh, and one of the questions here that I received was, in your experience, what's the what's the easiest or less invasive way for a clinician to move from a digital process uh, or from an analog process to a digital denture process? Yeah, doing that reference denture. Start with reference dentures first and do six to 12 of them. So you're, you're, you're confident and you're efficient with doing those reference dentures and then expand that into your normal denture offering now to a new patient. I think that's absolutely uh, the, the, the key. Uh, and if you have an intraoral scanner, uh, you can scan that reference denture right there in your office and send that to the lab digitally so the patient can leave with their, um, with their existing denture. I think that's the easiest and fastest way. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, great, great answer. I got one, I got one more, I might have another one, but one more. It, uh, from your experience hearing from clinicians, what is the most aesthetic denture, printed versus milled? Wow, that's a really tough one. Uh, I'm going to say printed is very good, right? Because you have lots of good pucks that are pre-polymerized and, and they have a good finish. Um, so they are very good. The first generation or two of printed resins that came out, Oh, and, and here's the other thing, I'm sorry. Printed, uh, milling disc also can give you fibers, okay? Because they're pre-manufactured. When you print, you can't get fibers in printed solutions. They'll clog up the printing jets and ports. So most of the printing resins that are out there, the first generation or two are very translucent and not very aesthetic and they weren't strong. Um, I, I'm proud to say that Densply Serona solved that problem. We created Lucitone digital print resin it is aesthetic. It has um, Lucitone shades that everyone knows and loves, 
and it's high impact. In fact, it's the only printed resin market uh, on the market right now that is high impact. Uh, so it has great work of fracture and great fracture toughness. Um, and so I do like pre-manufactured teeth personally. So as far as what is more aesthetic, that's a hard one to say. I would say that a premium mill denture is aesthetic. And I would say that the new premium denture printed with carbon and the Lucitone digital print is very aesthetic. But aesthetics are, are a bit difficult. They're subjective because what's aesthetic to you might be different from me. Um, but I would, I would say that the aesthetics with Lucitone digital print is outstanding. And then the physical property of that material is outstanding. So, um, great, great answer. What I just got another one, uh, while you were answering that is durability, uh, between the pre carded in the, the mill den uh, teeth. So yeah. I guess expand, expand into that. That's a great one. Yeah. So there are a lot of printed teeth on the market, printed tooth resins, and we don't know about their long-term clinical eff efficacy. Right. Most printed teeth are monochromatic as well. That's the other thing. M printed teeth are monochromatic. They're not very aesthetic. Mill teeth, because you can get multi-layer disc, are more aesthetic. But the, the 3D materials, okay, digital materials, still need to evolve. That's why I'm a big fan of pre-manufactured teeth. Um, and, and, you know, Vita makes pre-manufactured teeth. Ivaclar makes pre-manufactured teeth. Colzer has them. Uh, and, of course, we have them. So there's lots of good brands out there, but you want something that's very strong and aesthetic and wear resistant. And so IPN, for instance, uh, we know that material. It's been out for over 37 years. There's over 400 million dentures made with IPN teeth out there. So IPN is going to give you great wear, known wear, right? Clinically validated wear characteristics. They're going to give you good aesthetics. And there's never a problem with any company or any materials bonding their teeth to the denture bases. Whether it's milled or printed, teeth are not popping out of digital dentures. They are not. We've never experienced, even when we drive them over cars and trucks, the denture might break if it breaks, but the teeth are not popping off. Um, so the material durability has gotten far superior. I would stick with pre-manufactured teeth, and then I would use the printed resins or milled resins for my immediates, for my uh, economy dentures, um, because again, the long-term wear is not known yet. They haven't been on the market long enough to, to know that. Hopefully that answers that question too, John. Yeah, that's great. Those are three great questions. Um, that's all I have. I'm, Jessica, I don't know if any more have come through, yes. uh, but... We do have another one. Um, do labs offer custom staining of denture teeth, milled or printed or conventional? And how reliable is that? Yeah, um, so that was, um, it was interesting. The first two or three generations of printed resins came out. They were, like I said, very translucent and not very aesthetic. So labs were actually staining them with composites and doing buildups with composites to make them more aesthetic. Um, and it worked and they work fine. So yes, um, and Gradia is one particular product that's well known and is being used out there. Um, and then there are still labs that will do that. They'll take an existing printed or mill denture, or it could be an analog denture for that matter, and still do custom staining and characterization of that denture to uh, of course increase value, increase characterization and of course offer it as a premium product and to put their signature to it. So that is a viable option. It works with CAD CAM materials just like it works with regular acrylic. Uh, so there's lots of options out there and lots of labs do offer that service. And one more, I know we covered the aesthetics of um, milling versus printing, but is there any other advantages that you could share of milling versus printing or vice versa? Yeah, so milling is high quality, typically high strength, but it's low volume because it ties up a mill for about four hours. It takes about two hours to mill a denture base. Then you bond your teeth and it takes about another two hours of milling the intaglio surface of that. So it ties up a machine for about four hours. So the out, it's really a question of output, not quality. So you can do about two dentures, uh, up to three dentures in a give or take eight to 10 hour work um, day, okay? 
when it comes to printing, particularly with carbon and this Lucitone digital print, uh, you could print eight bases in two hours. So it's designed for production and high quality. So you could do 30 dentures a day, all right, with a carbon Lucitone digital print workflow. So strength, well, we have high impact mill dentures. We have high impact printed dentures now. So it's really more about the capacity that you need. And that's really a lab question unless, you know, not really a clinician question. Um, and then it's, okay, well, how much do you want to invest? A, a good CAD CAM system is, you know, $100,000 and a carbon's going to cost you $50,000 a year for a three year or five year lease. So it depends on pros and cons and it depends on the workflow that you want. I would say now that the printed workflows are faster and easier to learn and to do, but they cost more money. But once you invest, it's the way to go. Uh, milling will take a little more time, um, but they both offer exceptional results. And that's why DSG does both. They offer both a milled denture, a printed denture, and then they have analog dentures that are still either packed or poured or injected. So you've got five different ways of getting your denture made. Uh, eventually you'll see the industry shift to, to digital and printing is going to probably be just more prevalent. Okay. Great. Anything else? Yeah, uh, we've got a thanks for a great presentation. And thank you. Great presentation, David. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, we are at a two, I'm sorry, 1256. So we stayed within our promise of an hour. We have four more minutes for any other questions. Uh, but I really want to thank you for your, your time and, and listening. I hope it was useful and helpful. Um, I think you know, we tend to overcomplicate things and, and going back to just basic consumerism and basic treating people as, as, as people and listening with empathy can do a lot to cross sell or to upsell a patient into a better appliance. It's something that the consumer wants, whether they ask for it or not. So giving options in your treatment plans is huge and then let the customer make their own decision. Um, and they will, but make sure everyone on your dental team is, is aware of your, your education philosophy. Because usually once you walk out of the room, they, they immediately look to the hygienist or your assistant and say, hey, you know, what should I do? And they should be able to answer that question um, and, and fast and quickly and easily. So uh, thank you everyone, stay safe and uh, look forward to hearing from you again. Uh, there's my contact, feel free to uh, reach out if you have any comments or questions or need any uh, additional help. All right, thank you, John, and thank you, Jessica. Thank you, David. Um, and for further webinars from DSG, please refer to dentalservices.net backslash edu. Um, we hope to see you and David in the short future here. Uh, John, would you like to say any parting wishes? Oh, boy. Just, uh, da uh, David, thank you, as always, for your clean, crisp expertise on the denture space. So, um, Full, uh, full of information packed. Um, and again, be safe. Thank you. And can't wait to see you in person soon here. Uh, but take care and we'll talk soon. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye, everyone. Take care. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye.